Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over. So following the tradition that we've set uh, for the last couple of weeks is I've got way more slides than we'll be able to cover in, in whatever it is, hour and a half here. So I, I have two options. One is I could go into my very talk, my very fast voice and be like an auctioneer or anything, and, and you'll probably lose most of the information of it. But I'm not going to do that today. So uh, the, what I'm going to do is go slow and uh, take questions on the way through. There's a number of breakpoints in the talk, so please feel free to interrupt, as, as always. I, I think that's the most important part of Cider is the ability to, to quiz the speaker and... Uh, really delve into the, what, what he's trying to say. So I'd like to cover four main topics looking at the kind of lithospheric mantle. We'll start with uh, looking at the seismic characteristics of the, of the mantle and, what, and what's causing them, uh, just sort of a background uh, theoretical approach. Uh, and then we'll look at actual samples of the cratonic mantle and see how well they match uh, the expectations uh, that we get from the seismic characteristics. And then we'll go into a bit more uh, speculative or interpretive uh, aspect of it, where we'll look at constraints from uh, zenolith compositions on what the tectonic setting of uh, lithosphere production might have been and the processes that, that resulted in, in the lithospheres that we know. And if there's time at the end, I'll get to uh, the issue of metasomatism, which is the addition of material to the lithosphere that I think has uh, information both on how the lithosphere might have formed, but also uh, maybe the process that's ultimately responsible for creating the conditions that let it be destroyed. So let's get into it. I showed this slide in my previous talk. Uh, the point being is that continental lithospheres are not just crust. Uh, they have a clear expression well into the mantle. Uh, you can see that on a global tom tomographic image like this. I'd like to move on, though, in this talk to more detailed images. So we'll look at a few of these cratons uh, with uh, regional surveys. So do we have a pointer around? I don't... Oh, there it is. Thank you. Um, so this is from the Koffal uh, array, which is an experiment we did in, in the very late 90s. Uh, these are the seismometers that are strewn across southern Africa here. The craton itself is outlined in the, in the uh, whatever color, the gray colors here, and the little dots are, are seismometers. This is a cross-section through here of the p-velocities. Uh, and what you see here, the typical of cratons, these very high velocities beneath the Koffal craton proper. A little bit of disruption here when you move into this area. This area is under the area of the bush fog complex, which is a huge layered mafic intrusion that came into the, into the uh, Kafal craton about 2 billion years ago. And then it gets blue again as you move up into the Zimbabwe craton up here. As you move south of it, you move into a protozoic mobile belt where you see that the uh, velocities start to increase. And then when you move into the uh, much younger Cape Full belt, the velocities get back up towards uh, velocities typical of, of oceanic mantle. So this is what we're looking at uh, as typical of, of cratonic uh, material, these very high seismic velocities compared to uh, surrounding mantle. That's the Kafal. Here's a, an example from the Tanzanian uh, Roberta gave me. Uh, so here's S-wave tomography this time in a cross-section across the Tanzanian craton. This is different from the Kafal in the sense that the, the Tanzanian craton is surrounded by active rifts on both sides. And you can see that in the tomography here where the, the high velocities that are typical of the craton, this case down to only like 150 kilometers or so, are starting to be uh, eaten into or uh, whatever you want to call it, eroded by these uh, low-velocity materials that prob probably represent the uh, incoming uh, material of the uh, East African rift. All right, so the Wyoming craton, uh, I was pleased to see, I stole this right out of, of Gene Humphrey's cider talk last week, uh, I was pleased to see in the, in the recent tomography that the, the Wyoming craton is still there. Uh, it's uh, under serious assault uh, from all of this red stuff in the western U.S., uh, most notably which is the Yellowstone Snake River uh, plain trace here. Here you see it in a cross-section. So this is from our tomography, the High Lava Plains Project. Uh, so here's the cross-section showing across Washington, Idaho, across the Snake River Plain and into the Wyoming Craton here. So here you see the Yellowstone plume going down at least 1,000 kilometers, and then the Craton is over here. So unlike Gene's uh, uh, summary about that this being the conjugate for this Shatsky rise that is, is sort of plopped under Wyoming, what I see in this is that this is a uh, perfect expectation of, of the Wyoming craton. It goes right to the crust. It goes down to depths of about 200 kilometers or so. So it looks more or less like uh, what we expect for a typical craton. Uh, the difference here is that uh, there's all this red stuff around it, and this is the, not the only blue object in this picture. This is this Idaho curtain or whatever it is, uh, Silencia, according to Gene. I have no idea what this is, but it's, uh, you see equally high velocities that go, go well into the mantle. So this is the craton that we're going to be look, looking at in Wyoming. Rick, is there a subducted slab on that? There's lots of subducted slabs in this. Uh, you can see it. This, this is the down-going Juan de Fuca right here. Uh, 
uh, which goes steep and basically into the mantle until we lose it. And then it, when you look at different sections through this part of the world, you see all sorts of blue structures that uh, generally people interpret as stranded slabs. Uh, the interesting part about it is that they're, they're in pieces and they're sort of scattered all around at different depths and positions. And it's a, I think to me that's the most exciting part of the US array results in the Western US is not the low velocities, which we knew had to be there because of the volcanism. It's all these high velocities that are, that are strewn around the mantle. All righty. Uh, and then here's the uh, example from the North China Craton. I'm showing all of these because I hope to get to them in both the Zenlith record and, and uh, production mechanisms and survival mechanisms of, of craton, cratons. So here's a, a block map of the geology, so a good uh, Archean Western block. Uh, something happened here in the central block uh, that we'll look at uh, later in the talk. And then the eastern block, which was Archean, but uh, doesn't seem to be so now. This is the map of the craton, which is in this sort of area here on, this is Richard's uh, tomography. This is S-wave tomography. Uh, the interesting part in comparison to what I've been showing you with other cratons is that this is sort of the eastern block of the, of the craton, so it looks good and cold down to 200 kilometers. But this area uh, starts picking up about here in the central block, and you see these quite low velocities, and especially as you go out towards the coast here, you've got very low velocities. So as we'll see, this is a, a, a good example of a craton that's, that's sort of been torn apart. This may still be the craton that, that we're used to seeing in other places, but something seriously uh, uh, has gone wrong over the western uh, half, or sorry, the eastern half of this, this craton. Alrighty. So that's the size and characteristics of the cratons I'd like to look at. So they're characterized by thick, you know, 200, of order of 200 kilometer, very low velocity uh, 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 seismic material. So how can you do that? So there's two ways to make high seismic velocities. One is you just make the mantle cold. So here's from Sinti's uh, paper where you're looking at seismic velocity. This is uh, S velocity versus temperature. And you see you get on the order of 3% or so here velocity change for a uh, 500 degree change in temperature. So if you lower the, lower the temperature 500 degrees, the VS is 3% is uh, higher than it would be otherwise. Uh, you can also get it, though, by adding eclogite. So here's a VP uh, diagram versus depth for eclogite versus the types of pritatite that are likely to be in the mantle. And you see there's a huge step up in uh, eclogite. So one option to explain the high velocities is, is the presence of eclogite in the lithosphere. The trouble with that explanation, though, is if you look at density here, here's eclogite, here's the pritatites. So you see if you add enough eclogite to make to satisfy the seismic velocities of the lithosphere, then you make it so dense that it's unlikely to, to, to be buoyantly stable. And uh, this is a slide I showed uh, last week, or whenever I talked, uh, that shows that it is, in fact, these cratons are mostly stable. Uh, North China craton, I think, is an exception. You look here at rhenium osmium model ages, two different types. We don't worry about here. Just look at this column. So these are all the, uh, the xenoliths from the lithospheric mantle that are carried up by kimberlites through cratons. You see it's strongly peaked here in, in the Archean, so two and a half to three billion years. Uh, there is some uh, younger stuff here, but it's a minor component of it. So by and large, if you've got Archean crust, you've got Archean mantle under it. When you move off the Archean crust, though, you're picking up much younger mantle. So these, are not, these Archean cratons are not just sort of floating willy-nilly under crust. They are confined uh, to crustal blocks that have Archean crust in them as well. So they can survive for billions of years, which they would not do if they had tons of eclogite in them and were very dense. So this is what led uh, Tom Jordan in the 70s uh, to come up with his isopicnic model. Um, so if they're cold and you have this density increase that's due to the cold temperatures, you have to compensate that somehow. And the way you compensate that is you assume a density decrease that's due to chemical buoyancy. And what do we mean by chemical buoyancy? So this is a, a rather complicated diagram uh, from, actually this is a very nice paper by uh, uh, Derek and Chip, uh, exploring the, the partial melt extraction, uh, and the effect of partial melt extraction on density. So here you see the percent of partial melt removed at the bottom. If you go to shallow depth, so one GPA or so, you see that removing melt doesn't have a huge effect on density, so something like 1%, less than 1% or so. So it, it you know, lowers the density if you take a lot of melt out, but not by very much. You go to, the, to the, about 100, 150 kilometers depth, though, and you can see you get uh, density differences that are on the order of 2% by removing uh, melt. So this 2% difference uh, turns out to be quite important in, in creating the, the uh, isopicnic character of the lithosphere. So, I mean, this, this is the results, and uh, I don't know about you, but this always seems strange to me because when I think about melting, so you start out with some fertile garnet lurzlite here. It has a density of something like 3.4 grams per cc. You melt it, you made it melt in a residue. Both of those are lower density than your starting material. So that, that always struck me as kind of strange. The answer is, is that uh, 
in, in this kind of melting event, uh, mass might be conserved, but volume is not. So what happens here is that when you start with a garnet lurzolite, you've got a, a modal abundances that look like this. So olivine is most of it, 60%. Some orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene. And if you're in the garnet stability field, you can have as much as, as 15% garnet. Garnet is very dense, so 3.7 compared to all these other minerals are on the order of 3.3. If you're shallower than the garnet stability field, you're in spinel. Uh, and the difference between the garnet stability field and the spinel uh, field in terms of density is that the modal abundance of spinel is so low because it has uh, such high aluminum concentrations. There's not much aluminum in the mantle. So if you lose this spinel by partial melting, you lower the density, but you don't lower it by very much. If you lose all this garnet by partial melting, so you see a residue here where you've reduced the garnet modal percent to something like 2%, then you reduce the, the density of the re residue by something like, like 2%. Uh, and then the melt you do crystallizes into a basalt. It's very low density because all the aluminum that was in your garnet and spinel is now in plagioclase, and plagioclase is a very uh, low density mineral. And then if you stuff this down to high pressure and you turn the aluminous phase from plagioclase back into garnet, you make an eclogite out of it, then you end up with an eclogite that's even uh, much denser than the peridotite. So anyway, I hope that, that's helpful. I, I, I always was struggling with why melting lowers the density of the residue. So it lowers the density of the residue, but it doesn't really have much effect on seismic velocity. So this is from Sinti's paper again. Olivine mode, so the most depleted is at this end and fertile is down at this end. You see in S-velocities, uh, melt extraction really doesn't do very much at all. Uh, so it doesn't affect S-velocity. There is some correlation with P-velocity, but this total range here is only of order of percent or so. Uh, so it has some consequence, but, but not, a, not a lot. So the answer then is, is that... Uh, the high cartonic velocities are due to the low temperature of the cratons, and they get their buoyancy from this melt depletion. Uh, so that's the expectation that we get from the, the seismological results in their interpretation. So now uh, let's go and look at the samples of cratonic mantle and see how well they, they actually match those characteristics. So uh, th this one, this is like Roberta's slide, except none of us were robust enough to actually carry this guy around. So, so this is a prototype uh, zenith from about 150 kilometers deep uh, in the Premier Mine in South Africa. Uh, they all come up rounded like this because you can imagine them tumbling in the, in the kimberlite as they're coming to the surface, much like a, a river cobble would. So they, they make these big, nice dinosaur eggs. This is actually a problem when you're doing zenith hunting in Mongolia because stealing dinosaur eggs out of Mongolia is a big thing, and they catch you at the border for it. And they think these are dinosaur eggs, and it takes a lot of convincing to, to, to convince them that they're not. <laughs> So, so that's a problem. This is uh, Joe Boyd. Uh, Joe is responsible for a lot of the early work on, on uh, Mandel Zeal. He's a colleague at, uh, at Carnegie and uh, my other colleague, Steve Shirey, on this. So these things can be large, which lets you do lots of interesting things on them. They can be quite abundant in some areas where they're, they're uh, kimberlites. So here's an example in southern Africa. All the little dots here represent kimberlite pipes that have enough zealots in them to, to actually work on. So you see here you get good coverage both uh, on the craton, which is outlined in yellow here, and off the craton here in white. So you can do a lot of mantle geology uh, because you actually have the samples of it uh, when you have this kind of density of, of uh, kimberlite sampling. The other beauty of, of the mantle zenith record is that you can use mineral thermal barometry to basically reconstruct the stratigraphic column that's sampled by the kimberlite. So the kimberlite is just you know, blasting up to the surface, ripping this stuff off on the way. What you end up with at the top is just a pile of pritotite that you have no idea where it came from. But the mineral composition of it is such that it exchanges various uh, elements, so iron, magnesium, calcium exchange, calcium, and orthopyroxene. All of these exchanges are either temperature or pressure dependent. They're, when the material's in the mantle sitting there at 1,000 degrees, I mentioned diffusion in my talk uh, last time, uh, these minerals are, these elements are basically diffusing back and forth be between the minerals. They're equilibrating at the temperatures and pressures that that rock is sitting in in the mantle. Then when the kim kimberlite comes in, rips it off, brings it to the surface in a few hours or days, that's basically frozen in. So when you get a, a mineral th uh, thermobarometry of a zenith, you're recording the conditions just before the kimberlite picked it up. So these are, in essence, fossil geotherms because they're, they're sampled at the time of the kimberlite eruption. I'm not going to go through all these. This, this is an excellent review paper. If you're interested, this Brian Kohler paper uh, really uh, goes through the whole technique and uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the data and background for it. But the beauty of it is, is that you can reconstruct the stratigraphic column. So here's, here's a slide from, from Roberta's work. Um, 
What you get then is you get this just jumble of peridotites that you can put pressures and temperatures on, and what you see is they define these nice cratonic geotherms that we've seen several times in the last couple of weeks. These are the actual data, and you draw a line through them. So we've talked a lot about uh, what these are and what they mean. They seem to intersect. These, this is the uh, adiabatic geotherms at 1350 and 1400. So you intersect those at around uh, 150, 200 kilometers or so, suggesting that that's the base of the, of the lithospheric mantle somewhere in here. And then one other thing uh, I'd like to point out is that they're not all the same. So this is defined by the, the South African cratons, both the Zimbabwe and the Kotval. If you take that exact same line and move it over here and compare it to the slave, you see the slave are offset to lower temperatures, and actually just to quite low temperatures. So 150 uh, kilometers depth, you can be 200, cold, 200 degrees colder in the slave lithosphere than in the Kotval lithosphere. So there's a pretty big variation in, in uh, geotherms within the uh, cratonic lithosphere, depending on where you are. Um, you can see that here. This is a jumbled slide of, of basically not, not all, but all the data as of 1998 uh, and Roberta Rudnick's compilation. Uh, I show this for a few reasons. One is to show you how, how much variation there is. So there's the slave at the low temperature side. The red are the open symbols from the Kotval craton here. Uh, but there are other uh, cratons like Tanzania here is offset to much higher temperatures. And that makes sense because it's in this volcanically active area in the, the East, uh, East African Rift Zone. Uh, Vitam here is part of the Siberian Craton, but it's near the Baikal Rift, uh, which is, again is another volcanically active area. And so when you're in these kind of recently active areas, you tend to see that the mantle lithospheres have their temperatures offset. Yeah. What kind of error do you have when you do this uh, uh, That's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> When you see the air estimates that are provided by the people that create these, you're talking tens of degrees and, and fractions of a GPA. Uh, when you compare different geothermometers, the differences between them can be larger than that. So, so uh, I, I would say I think, I think you're reasonable within 50, 50 C and probably half a GPA, uh, maybe even better than that in pressure. I know, Chip, do you have any better? Yeah. I think okay. So. Uh, uh, there, I mean, there's a large number of these geothermometers, and, and it's kind of a cottage industry to compare them and see where they give the same answer and where they don't give the same answer. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out in this slide, though, uh, which is something I've been harping on the last couple of weeks, is if you look at the gra graphite to diamond uh, stability line, we all know that diamond is the high-pressure form of carbon. So, you know, so if you move from here to here, you go from graphite to diamond. But if you think about the x-axis instead of the y-axis, diamond's also the low temperature form of, of carbon in the mantle. So there's only a small window here where the temperatures are low enough that you sample the diamond stability field within the lithosphere. So if you think about these geotherms uh, being uh, higher in the past, so move, moving out towards where the adiabat is, you would not find diamond in the continental lithosphere. Uh, and yet I, I showed you slide... Uh, in the last talk that uh, shows diamond formation dating back to as old as, as 3.56 billion years. So this is the diamond inclusion isochron that I showed you from the slave province. So I, I think this is reasonable evidence that cratonic lithosphere cooled quickly after it formed, and it cooled down to the point where you had diamonds in the lithospheric mantle. And so if you go back to that diagram, you've got, oops, wrong way. Go back to that diagram, that means you're, you're cooling down below this uh, diamond graphite stability field. And if you're sampling them, you're probably in this region. So you're talking about temperatures of 1,000 to 1,200 degrees, even in the early Archean. Get there. Uh, no. I mean, kimberlites uh, are very low degree partial melt of the mantle. Uh, I mean, Raj went, th went through this a little bit. Uh, there's no clear indication that the kimberlite eruption temperatures have changed with time any more so than basalts have at the same composition. So the kimberlites through time that we have are the same composition, so probably the same degree of melting. So the, the background mantle, the trouble is we only have kimberlites back to 
I think it's 1,800 million years is the oldest one. So we don't have kimberlites in the Archean. There were kimberlites in the Archean, just they're, they're gone. Uh, kimberlites are easily erodible. They're hard to find even in modern times, so they're really hard to find if they're, they're old. All right. So I'm getting close to the end of the issue of the temperature structure of, of the lithosphere. So this suggests that it, uh, it, it's cold, which matches the seismology, and it got cold rather quickly. So it was cold in the Archean. So the other prediction from seismology, then, is that the uh, manolithosphere should be composed of residues of partial melting, and, in fact, it is. Uh, here's a couple of examples of this. This is a, a limited data set just so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, this is just for the Kopval and the Siberian uh, lithospheric mantles. So this is a plot of, of magnesium concentration versus iron concentration in funny units in, in moles. What was it? Was God's units? Who, who said that? I, for, I forget who that was. But So they're good units. They're just not ones we're used to looking at. Uh, on a diagram like this, primitive mantle starts at this green dot here, and then as you remove partial melt, you start moving up this way and increasing the magnesium concentration of the residue and decreasing the iron by a little bit. So these represent boundaries of, this would be 10% partial melt removal, 20% partial melt removal, 30% partial melt removal, and so on. And then the other lines on this diagram represent the temperatures where that, that melting is occurring. So if you look at these, you start a primitive mantle. Here you can see that the residues in the Kopval represent uh, residues of something like 25 to as much as 45% uh, partial melt extraction uh, at temperatures as high as 1,700, but in the range of 15 to 1,600 degrees. So these are residues of extensive partial melt extraction. Uh, that's true if you look at a, an increased data set. This is from a, a more recent work by uh, Pearson and Wittig. You see there's a, a larger number of cratons here, but the story is still pretty much the same. Different plot, aluminum. Aluminum is a highly incompatible element. Primitive mantle would be up here. Uh, as, you, as you melt, uh, you remove the aluminum, so you move down in aluminum space and up in magnesium space. And these curves represent the pressures of, of melting, so the different trajectories that you get depending on where the, where the melting actually occurs. So what you see here is, again, that uh, you're looking at pressures on the order of, I can't, that's 7 GPA there, so you're looking probably at 5 to 3 GPA, which is, is I think, a pretty typical estimate. Uh, and again, uh, very large amounts of melt extraction, so on the order of 30% partial melt extraction. So what does this kind of melt extraction do to densities? Uh, so this is work that Dave James did, uh, looking in particular at uh, the Kopval xenolith suite. So what he did here was take mineral elastic parameters and just add them up to get the uh, velocities and densities of, of the lithospheres themselves at a given temperature. So you can look at this in two ways. So the top one here calculates the composition of the, uh, the actual depleted pyrolytes. So these are Kopval pyrolytes versus pyrolite. Pyrolite is just another name for fertile mantle. So these curves are calculated at the same geotherm. So this is along the geotherm that's in the Kopval craton, and if you had fertile mantle at that same geotherm, these would be the densities that you calculate. So here you can see that at the same temperature, uh, at the same depth, these are substantially, they're several percent uh, more buoyant than, than fertile mantle. So again, this gets us back to this isopicnic idea where the, the melt depletion of these is giving them the buoyancy that compensates for their cold temperature. So that's one way to look at it. That's at the same temperature. The other way to look at it is when would this be isopicnic? And this is the other calculation that Dave did. So here we're looking at the uh, um, xenoliths calculated at different uh, geotherms. So the Kopval data is all those little dots there. Those are the ones that we have from the Kopval craton calculated along the Kopval geotherm. So a nice cold cratonic geotherm. And then what Dave did was basically up the geotherm for the fertile mantle until he got a, a fit that more or less went through the, the Kopval prototypes. I don't know well how well you can see that, but this is the, uh, this is the cratonic geotherm here. This is in temperature. You can see this better if you pull it up on, on the diagram. This is on the, on the wiki already. Uh, you can get it basically over to an oceanic geotherm here. So you're getting to 1,000 degree temperatures at like 60 kilometers depth. So more or less like a, a typical modern uh, ocean ridge setting. And in that case, then you can come near isopicnic. If you actually look at the points you see here, these are the calculations of different pressures, uh, uh, different depths. These are for spinel prototype down here. These are for uh, uh, garnet pyrolite here. You see the big uh, uh, density offset when uh, garnet comes in. Uh, but So this is line is sort of a fit through those. But you can see this isopicnic idea is, is true in principle, and it's probably not completely true in, in detail. So it doesn't take much of a temperature variation to, to wobble this line back and forth. 
to make the, man, the lithospheric mantle either slightly denser or slightly more buoyant than a uh, typical surrounding fertile mantle. So this gets to the issue that we, we saw earlier with the, the dynamic topography of cratons always showing up. Once you move the isostasy of the crust, they seem to be a little bit low, which would suggest that the lithospheric mantle is a little denser than isopicnic. Uh, I don't think that's at all uh, disallowed by the Zenlith data. There's a lot of argument about exactly where, where these uh, relations of density would, would match and, and become isopicnic. Uh, I also think it's interesting is that it seems to have, Earth seems to have adjusted to it right to this, this tipping point. So that if you make the lithospheric mantle a little bit hotter, it's going to be a lot more buoyant. If it gets a little bit colder, it could become dense enough where it actually becomes unstable and, and delaminates. So, so it, it's playing this game where it, you know, it's adjusting its density to, to uh, compensate for the temperatures around it. All righty, so let's move on. Um, I, is that clear? I mean, those are sort of the basics. And, you know, if you know anything about continental lithospheres, that's what you need to know. The rest of it here, we're going to look at the data in some more detail. It's going to get more confusing, particularly if you're not a geochemist. Uh, but the information I'll try to do now will address the site's information of, of cratonic lithosphere, its relationship to the continental crust, and uh, some of the processes that may have resulted in its destruction. So before moving on, if there's questions, it's a good time to ask. All right. All righty, so let's look at the conditions of, of where the melting took place. Uh, we can ask, you know, is this high degree of melt removal an indication that the mantle was just hotter in the Archean, so you had higher degrees of partial melting on average? Uh, does it relate to the tectonic setting of melting? Another way that you can get uh, high degree melting is to add water to the mantle. So this may not be hot. It may just have been a water flushed mantle. That's another option that we'll explore. And the other one is this tectonic winnowing of dense components. And I'll describe what I mean by that. So what I've done here is take Bill McDonough's uh, data set. This is from my reviews of geophysics paper a few years ago. Uh, Bill McDonough's data set for prototypes from different tectonic settings. So these are abyssal prototypes here and massif or orogenic prototypes in, in the green here. Uh, in the middle is off craton spinel prototypes. So these are xenoliths from from uh, areas that are off craton. Uh, this panel is important because this field here is simply drawn around the majority of the data points in this field, and then it's translated to the other, other figures. So there's nothing magical about that, that balloon. Uh, it's, it's just to guide your eye on it. What is interesting is that fertile mantles up here at the blue point, these represent the melt extraction curves depending on pressure, so 1 GPA, 4 GPA, and I think there's a 7 GPA curve there as well. So again, you're looking at somewhere in the 3 to 4 GPA as a sort of a typical uh, pressure of melt extraction from these. But what I'd like you to see, so if you look at this, this banana here that uh, outlines the field, uh, the thing that's different between the three panels isn't so much the maximum degree of depletion. So aluminum concentration at the lowest, magnesium at the highest. So this is the depleted end of the, of the diagram. And you see that they're all more or less in the same place in, in the maximum amount of depletion. The real difference is that the cratonic lithosphere doesn't have the fertile component in it. Okay? So what does this mean? So one option is that the mantle was just hotter. You always melt to the point where you, you, you never left behind a... a a fertile re residue, unlike you did in the Proterozoic or, or even in modern times here, where you have a lot of, lot of more fertile material. The other option that I think is, is interesting uh, to consider is the possibility that you actually did have that fertile material in the lithosphere when it was forming, except the process of putting that material together into a lithosphere removed mechanically, basically erosively removed the dense components in the lithosphere. One of the issues that we'll confront in a few slides here is that there's not a lot of eclogite in the lithosphere. You had to remove a lot of melt from this material. That melt was basalt and would turn into eclogite if it was subducted. It's not in the crust, as I'll try to convince you. So you probably had eclogite in the lithospheric mantle, but you certainly don't have it now, and you don't have the fertile components. So I've always wondered whether there's, there's some tectonic winnowing that, that results in uh, sort of density sorting within the lithospheric mantle that removes this, this portion of the, the uh, differentiation curves. All righty. So this is the slide to convince you that the, the melts that remove from the uh, mantle are not the continental crust. So here's fertile mantle with a few elements and depleted mantle. Uh, you see the main thing is you lose basically all of the aluminum that goes out in the melt. Uh, magnesium goes up by quite a bit. For a highly incompatible element like barium, you, you lose essentially everything that all move, goes off into the melt. But at 20 to 30 part, percent partial melting, the kind of melt that you get out of the mantles is either picrite or commodiite. So you look at those compositions, they're, they're modulo silica, they've got a lot of aluminum, uh, they've got a lot of magnesium, sort of 18 to maybe 30 percent uh, magnesium if they're a commodiite. Uh, 
and lots of calcium. You compare that with, this is uh, Roberta's estimate of the average continental crust. They don't look anything like it. So they're not andesitic. Um, so that le leads us into the situation that Roberta left us with, is you either have to start with a basaltic crust that looks like this and process the hell out of it to get it to looking like an andesite through weathering, through wet partial melting again, through you know, any one of the processes that Roberta went through to explain how you get an andesitic crust out of what started as a basaltic crust, or you have to reach the conclusion that, in fact, this crust is not from this melt. And that's the conclusion I'll derive. And the way that I, I'll go to that is uh, if you think about a very simple mass balance. So here's a mass balance equation. You take some amount of, uh, some mass of, of primitive mantle, uh, you multiply it times the concentration of some element A. Uh, if you just take that mass and allow that part of the mantle to, to melt, to differentiate, to produce a depleted mantle and continental crust, so you have a mass balance. You have to conserve the mass of the element, so mass of A and uh, primitive mantle times the, the mass of primitive mantle has got to equal to the concentration of that and the depleted mantle times the mass of it plus that concentration in the crust uh, times the mass of the continental crust. And then if you do this as just an increment, so you take some quantity of, of primitive mantle and, and melt it, you end up with that uh, other equation. So the mass of primitive mantle just has to equal the sum of the two products. Uh, you put those two together, and then you apply this to the different elements that you could do in, in the kind of concentration tables. So you take aluminum, you plug aluminum into this equation, you find out that the mass of depleted mantle is about three times the mass of the continental crust. So that's not on, uh, that it's consistent with the idea that this stuff came out of the volume of mantle that's equal to the present lithosphere. So you think about a continental crust is 35 kilometers thick. There's going to be a density difference, but we'll ignore that. So three times 35 is 100 and something, right? 105. Uh, so it's not quite there, but it's getting close to the kind of volumes that you see in the continental lithosphere. So on a major element basis like aluminum, you could conclude that the, that the continental crust is the material that came out of the mantle. But when you look at an element like barium, so here's another one. It's highly enriched in continental crust, 456 ppm versus 6 in the mantle. You do this same equation for it, and you find out that the mass of the depleted mantle is 68 times the mass of the continental crust. What that's telling you is that the amount of barium in the continental crust did not come out of the lithospheric mantle. There is not enough barium in the, all the lithospheric mantle combined to, to make the barium in the continental crust. So again, this is another indication that you have to go to multiple stage processes in order to get the continental crust. It's, it's basically an end member distillate. It's not a, the result of single stage partial melting of the mantle. Uh, one way to do this, uh, barium in particular, is an element that's one of the fluid mobile elements in, a, in an island arc setting. So one of the ways that you could get this level of enrichment in barium is that if you, you're forming continental crust in a, in a convergent margin, you're transferring that barium basically from the oceanic system through partial, partial melting of the slab or fluid transfer out of the slab, and you're adding that to the continental lithosphere, which is then melting to, to make some kind of crustal composition. But you're artificially enriching it in barium because you're sampling the, the oceanic part of the system or the, the plate tectonic part of the system and not just this uh, uh, part of the mantle that will end up in your rigid lithosphere. So I, I know this is getting confusing, but the point of this is simply that Continental crust cannot be a single stage uh, partial melt of the mantle or the continental lithospheric mantle. There has to be more, more complications to that. And I think those complications give us some idea about the process of forming uh, the continental lithospheric mantle. All right. So uh, one of the questions that always comes up is uh, we see this very high degree of melt extraction out of continental lithospheric mantle. We always like to attribute that to uh, a mantle that was unusually hot in the, in the Archean. Uh, do we see a secular change? So we think that the mantle temperature, background mantle temperature is cooled by something like 200 degrees over the last uh, 3 billion years. Do we see that in the composition of, of lithosphere through time? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, so here's an example from the Kopval craton. So these are all the Archean prototypes. They have the very low aluminum concentrations that are typical of these highly depleted residues. Uh, here's work that uh, Phil Janney did with us, uh, looking at the uh, mobile belts around uh, the Kopval craton. So these are one to two GA uh, mobile belts that were added around it, and the lithospheric mantle. So here's the rhenium depletion age. You see the age of formation of these is consistent with the age of the overlying crust. So or like one to one and a half GA. It's not the Archean age as you see in the Kopval. And then you look at the aluminum plot, which is uh, what I'm using here is the monitor of depletion, and you see again that it peaks in the range of like 1%. So I would argue that that is not tremendously different from, from that plot. Uh, 
So in this case of the, the border zone around the Kotval craton, the Proterozoic mantle seems to be compositionally similar to the mantle under the Kotval craton. When you go away from that, though, and you go into more active areas, here's Vitam, I showed you that in the temperature slide, is a currently magmatically active area. Basin and range, of course, is active. Uh, southeast Australia is, has uh, lots of modern volcanism. And the trans-North China craton, which is one of the cratons that we think has fallen apart. You look at uh, the ages, they're all over the place. They're mostly young. Uh, you look at the aluminum concentrations, and they tr they're, again, all over the place, but they trend to much more fertile values. So this is the kind of evidence that would suggest that, in fact, well, we're not getting this level of depletion that we used to get, uh, but when you go to the Proterozoic, it was certainly uh, these levels of depletion are seen as young as 1 to 1.5 GA. So if it's a secular change, it's, it's not as obvious as one would expect for this just simply declining temperatures with time. Questions? Okay, so where do you get uh, degrees of partial melt extraction like this? I, let's ignore this for a while. We'll come back to this in a way that, that's more understandable in, in a few slides. This one is the one I would like to look at. So aluminum concentration versus pyritites from a variety of tectonic settings. Okay, so here's primitive mantle up here at four, four something percent aluminum. Uh, and what you see is cratonic mantle is here. On craton is there. But you see that there's a number of tectonic settings that result in the magnitude of depletion that you see in uh, cratonic mantle. Uh, some of those are interesting, oceanic arcs. So the reason that you get such highly depleted prototypes in arcs isn't because you're extracting commoditeite, it's because you're melting that mantle over and over again because you're assisting that melting with addition of water. So this, again, is this sort of multi-stage process that's driven because you've, you've got a replenishment of, of the incompatible element water uh, because of the subduction system. Uh, four arc is the same sort of problem. Here's your on craton, passive margin. I don't even know where those samples are from. You get this in plume lavas, like uh, you know, high temperature lavas, like ocean island basalts. So that is another traditional explanation for this level of depletion. Uh, and then abyssal prototypes are a little less. Uh, so you might see sort of the secular change in temperature of the oceanic mantle here. But the answer is there's a lot of tectonic environments that can produce this, this uh, degree of melt depletion. So let's look at some other. Uh, indications uh, of, of the conditions of melting. This is, a, this is one of these complicated diagrams that chemists love, but everybody else just, ah. So uh, again, rare earth patterns, these rare earths are, are more incompatible than these. But the difference in this is, is that garnet, in particular, is very strong at fractioning these. So garnet actually likes these elements. It hates these elements. So if you have garnet present in the source, and you leave it behind during partial melting, that residue in the mantle will have high concentrations of these elements. So here are melting curves. So there's 5%, 10%, 20% melting when there's residual garnet present. So this is the uh, rare earth concentrations in the residue. You see you've reduced the light rare earths tremendously because they're strongly incompatible. But in garnet, uh, these elements are compatible. So your residue is going to have uh, latetium abundances up here. Uh, when you look at prototypes, here's some of the examples. These are Kopfal, uh, Craton prototypes, the work of, of Nina Simons, PhD, at, at our place. Um, you see that they have quite uh, large enrichments in light rare earth, which will, that's another indication of a secondary process that I'll explain in a while. Uh, but the key to this is that they have these very low uh, heavy rare earth element concentrations. So how do you do that? If this is what you expect from a residue of melting in the garnet field, how do you get down here? The answer is you don't have garnet left over. So you either melt past the point where you exhaust garnet, so there's none left in the residue, or you melt shallow enough where garnet is not stable. So all your luminous phase is transferred over to spinel. So here's 5, 10, 20 percent melting with garnet residue. Here's what you get if you start adding spinel to the residue. So you're basically bringing the melting point up past the point of, of, of garnet exhaustion and growing spinel. And then here's uh, the area that you get with just spinel melting. So you see here the suggestion from these data in the rare earth patterns is that the residues actually were melted at fairly low pressure. So they're not melting at 150 kilometers, they're melting at 50 kilometers, and they're somehow making it down to 150 kilometers. So again, this is an idea that there's, there's tectonic processing involved in turning what are probably shallow residues into this deep, thick, uh, depleted lithospheric mantle. All right. Uh, this is an interesting way to approach this problem. Uh, this is using uh, magnesium number of olivine, so it's down, down at the very bottom here, uh, as, as a monitor depletion. The higher the numbers, the higher the depletion. And then if you do the uh, kind of melting models that Claude Hertzberg has done, uh, Ken Condi showed us a couple of those in, in his second talk, 
Uh, what you would expect as residues from those melting models look like this depending on what the temperature of the ambient mantle is, so the, the potential temperature of the background mantle. So you have a modern mid-ocean ridge basalt mantle here. You would get a, a distribution of, uh, of degree, a magnesium number in, of olivine in the residue uh, with depth that looks something like that. So it doesn't look anything like the, the cratons. Uh, hot mid-ocean ridge basalt, so that's basically like a mid-ocean ridge spreading center, but you've raised the temperature of the ambient mantle by a couple hundred degrees. So an example maybe like, like an Archean ocean ridge, for example. Uh, a plume would be another 100 degrees. A hot plume would be another 100 degrees above that. So basically all these curves are doing is changing the potential temperature of the mantle uh, uh, that's melting to provide the, the lithospheric peridotites. Then the, black, uh, the darker uh, lines here represent sort of depth averaged magnesium numbers for peridotite collections from the different uh, uh, lithospheres. So here's the cop wall. You see there's not a lot of change with depth. Uh, at shallow depths, it's consistent with kind of a hot mid-ocean ridge basalt temperature, so 1,500, 1,550, maybe up to 1,600 or so potential temperatures all the way down. There's no clear indication of, of uh, change in uh, degree of depletion with depth. Uh, I think this is consistent with the seismology that we see in the Cotval Craton. It looks nice and blue all the way to the bottom. Uh, when you go to other cratons, though, in particular, let's look at the slave because we have the, the, uh, lots of tomography and, and other seismic results for the slave craton. You see that, in fact, there is a step over towards less depleted material at the bottom. Uh, so you're down to uh, magnesium numbers of 91 instead of 93 at the top. So there's a suggestion here in both the slave and the North Atlantic craton that this cratonic lithosphere actually gets more fertile as you go down into it. Uh, you know, why is that? Uh, there's two explanations for it. One is that if you actually look at the way that the slave was constructed, I, I stole this slide, it's another slide from Gene. I have, to, I have to write Gene and tell him how much I appreciate him giving my talk. Uh, so uh, I pulled this off of, of Gene's slide. This is a lot of work that's been done by Mike, Mike Bostick and, and uh, uh, Snyder in, in the slave province. And the key to the slave province is that you have this very layered structure. I, you know, I mean, rare earth patterns to me are, are clear as anything. Uh, when I see something like that, I'm sure it's what your non-geochemists non think of the uh, you know, rare earth pattern. I, I don't see anything in this until somebody draws lines in it that, that explain to me what they are. So, uh, so you've got these nice little layers in this. You can see this in, the, in these reconstructions. of uh, This is uh, uh, Bostick's uh, receiver function work with uh, various refraction lines that have been driven off. There's also Alan Jones' work on, on uh, EM. There's a, a conductive layer that looks very much like this. So the information that you get from the geophysics in the slave is it looks like a stacked uh, set of slabs. It looks like a, a very layered craton. You can look at the petrologic evidence from it. Uh, this is work that Mayo Kapalova has done. Uh, there's kimberlite pipes all over this area. So what she did is look at the, the collection from the different pipes, and you can reconstruct that north central down to the south. And what you see is, in fact, the uh, slave craton has uh, got this top layer that's extremely depleted prototype. So this 93 94 magnesium numbers, so this is extremely depleted material. Uh, this is the stuff that's actually the really cold material in, in the slave lithosphere that I showed, showed you uh, in some of the early slides. But then we go below that, you get into more fertile stuff. So there's peridotite down here that's uh, got magnesium numbers like 91 or something. Uh, and then uh, also when you get down into here, you get into areas where there's actually uh, peroxinite, so there's lots of peroxinite in areas like this. So you see a very compositionally layered uh, lithosphere for the slave craton. You don't see this at all in the Cotval craton. So when you're thinking about forming cratons, it's not likely that you form them all in exactly the same way. Uh, so this is one way that you get compositional variation with depth. But another one is, is this. This is, this is from uh, Derek and, and Chip's paper. Uh, and, and I hope they'll correct me if I interpret this wrong. We talked a bit about this last night at the bar, but it was after a couple beers. So, so if I interpret it wrong, that, you know, I'll, I'll blame that. But what this is showing you is sort of what I, I showed you in the, the first slide I took from them, is that if you melt at uh, shallow depth, where you're working in the cement uh, prototype field, you can't take out enough melt to lower the density enough to become isopictic. Okay? You have to do that in the garnet stability field. So what that uh, is shown here then is basically to create a constant density to lithosphere, as you go down in depth, you can tolerate more fertility. So, uh, and that's because the density difference caused by melt extraction gets so much bigger that you don't have to take out as much melt. So if you think about this, if you're looking at a 200-kilometer lithosphere and uh, you have some fertility index that are just going by heat flow, this is heat flow out of the whole lithospheric section? Is that right? At the surface. Okay. So it's both uh, lithospheric mantle and crust? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
So you know, take a, a higher value. So typically it's 40, but if you had it like a 47, 200 kilometer thick, you could actually tolerate a lower section of the lithosphere that only has on the order of uh, say 10 to 15 percent partial melt removal. So this is another way that uh, you know the mantle basically adjusts the amount of melt extraction to adjust its, its buoyancy so that it be, uh, stays stable in the lithospheric mantle. And I think we're actually seeing this when when you look at plots like the uh, this one from from Pearson. So you're getting more fertile compositions at the base here. You're getting the same thing in the North Atlantic craton. So I think this is a fairly fertile uh, approach to to address this kind of uh, a problem. All righty. Uh, at this rate, with no questions, I'm actually going to make it through the talk. So, so uh, please feel free to interrupt whenever you want. Um, it's, it's going to get even more complicated. So if you thought that uh, section was complicated, what do you see this? Um, so this gets to the idea that we've been modeling the continental lithospheric mantle as a simple single-stage residue of melt extraction. That is almost certainly not correct. I tried to show you that with the mass balance modeling for the continental crust. You simply cannot get all the barium in the continental crust out of the continental lithospheric mantle. Any one of those highly incompatible elements, it just does not work. So other things have happened to that mantle, and the evidence for that is clear in, in at least some of the cratonic settings. So here's an example. This is an aluminum and silicon versus iron plot. Uh, if you start at a primitive mantle by the star here, when you remove melts, you get curves that look like this depending on pressure, so 3, 5, and 7 GPA. 30% uh, melting, 50% melting, for example. And what you see, particularly in the silica plot, uh, is that you do have a lot of uh, lithospheric prototypes that are in that region, but you also see these ones that are very silica enriched. And this is a bit of a history of cratonic studies, is that uh, most of these silica-rich prototypes came out of the Kotval craton. Kotval was uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, cratons to be studied in, in detail because of all the diamond mining in South Africa. Uh, so the wisdom at the time, this is probably late 80s, was that one of the characteristics of continental lithospheric mantle is it's unusually silica enriched. Now it turns out that the Kotval craton is probably the only craton that's unusually silica enriched. So when you go to other cratons, uh, you know, they're all down in here. So we had this very long, decade-long argument about what all this meant, and it turns out that it's probably a unique feature of the Kotval. Uh, so there were two explanations at the time. One is that at very high pressures of melting, you can get orthopyroxene-rich uh, uh, residues. Uh, so people were talking about plume melting starting at four or 500 kilometers. Claude Herzberg was one of the proponents of this. The other explanation for this, though, and, and I think one that's more, more reasonable, is that this represents a secondary addition to the, to the mantle. So you start out with a residue like this, and you add uh, silica. How do you do that? Well, this uh, is, turns us back to seismology. This is work that uh, Laura Wagner did uh, in geology a few years ago. So we're looking again at tomography here. Um, this is the coast of Chile and Argentina. You probably couldn't tell that unless they told you, but, but it is. Uh, this is the area of flat slab subduction, and what's shown here in particular are these uh, very low VPVS ratios that are found in, in uh, areas around this flat slab subduction. So in this work, they, they compiled the VPVS ratios of a number of mantle minerals and also some things like quartz, things that might be in the subducted plate. And what you see is that enstatite here, orthopyroxene, so the silicon-rich component of the mantle, has an unusually low VP, VPVS ratio. So their interpretation of this was, in fact, these low VPV VSs that are seen around the slab area are in fact due to orthopyroxene enrichment in that section of the mantle. Uh, this is a plot where they took Kotval prototypes, Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, Kotval prototypes according to the orthopyroxene modal uh, abundances and calculated VPVS ratio. And it turns out the only ones that fit the, the box here is the observed low v, VPVSs, uh, and the only ones that fit this are the orthopyroxene enriched Kotval prototypes. So uh, silica enrichment, one way to get that is that you have silica-rich melts coming off a subducting slab, silica-rich melts or fluids. Uh, they're percolating through a prototytic mantle above them, uh, and what they leave behind basically is orthopyroxene. So that would be one way to, to move off into these orthopyroxene-enriched regions. Uh, this is one of, I think, several arguments that, that hint that uh, cratonic lithospheres involve a subduction zone history. So whether they form that way, is unclear. You have this issue with they had to have been melted at very shallow depth to get the, the heavier earth element depletion, but you have things like the silicon enrichment, and we'll see other trace element evidence that suggests they have been acting as filters for, for uh, uh, slab material that's, that's gone underneath them. All righty. So the trouble with uh, 
normally if you're talking about uh, looking at subductions on signals, I would, would be talking to you about barium niobium ratios or things like that. Uh, I would like to be able to do that, but the trouble is, is that these are depleted pyridotites at very low concentrations of incompatible elements because they are depleted, and yet they're being carried to the Earth's surface in what's the most incompatible element rich magma on Earth. So bearing abundances in a kimberlite are probably 10,000 times the bearing abundance in a residue. So they are very sensitive to contamination. What you see quite often when you look at uh, uh, pyridotite xenoliths is uh, you can measure a Horrock pattern. It looks something like this. These are uh, examples from the Somerset Island uh, samples. So you get rare earth patterns that look, you know, they start off uh, sort of trending down in the heavier rare earths, but then they show this enrichment in the light rare earth elements, which basically requires two-stage melting because residue, a residue should look like this. Um, so there's something funny going on with this. But when you go to the individual minerals and you measure their rare earth pat patterns in, in an iron probe or something, uh, and then you reconstruct the whole rock pattern, you get something that looks like this. So when you measure a whole rock, it looks like this. When you reconstruct it out of the minerals, it looks like that. And the answer is, is what's the difference here is probably kimberlite on the, on the grain boundaries. How do you know that? So you look at a plot like this. So here's your terbium. So this is at this end of the diagram, one of the... Uh, semi-compatible or moderately incompatible rare earth elements. Uh, you start at primitive mantle here, so high aluminum, high ytterbium concentrations. You do partial melt extraction. That's what these curves show. Partial melt extraction moves you down in lines like this. These are all the data for the different kimberlites. You see that they more or less follow the same trend. Uh, so this probably, ytterbium concentrations probably reliably track uh, the history of partial melt extraction from the mantle. This little line here represents what happens when you add a kimberlite back to this residue. It doesn't do very much. The reason it doesn't do very much is kimberlites are, are depleted in the heavy earth elements. They have very steep light earth enrichment. So the heavy earth element abundances in a kimberlite are not that much different from the residual mantle. A little bit more, but not, not a lot. So you do mixing up. This one? Uh, I'll answer that here. Uh, so so this, this is of the order of a couple percent kimberlite. So uh, you do the same thing for barium, okay? So barium would start out here in primitive mantle. Melt extraction curves look like this because barium is a very highly incompatible element. You'll re be removing all of that with the melt when you take it out. Here's the actual data measured for uh, pyridotite xenoliths. You see it looks nothing like the melt curves whatsoever. Uh, if you take a residue that's down here, this is a tenth of a percent addition of kimberlite, and at the end here it's 1%. So it takes you just a sniff of kimberlite to totally overwhelm the abundances of an element like barium in a whole rock uh, uh, xenolith. So you have to be very careful on the interpretations of petrogenesis when you're using elements uh, at, at that end of the, uh, the incompatibility spectrum. Uh, some of this is unquestionably kimberlite contamination, but I don't think it all is. Uh, the reason I don't think it all is is, uh, is in the next series of arguments. Uh, one is if you look at the isotopic history of these. So uh, here's two plots. Uh, these are both isotope systems. Gamma osmium is a 187, 188, 188 uh, osmium isotopic composition relative to a standard that's in, is, is in percent. Epsilon nidimium is 143, 144 nidimium relative to the standard. In, in this case, it's in parts in 10,000. So the variations are much smaller. So the rhenium osmium system, I went through this a little bit in my original talk. So rhenium is a highly incompatible element, but osmium is compatible. And it's the only radiometric system that has a compatible element in it. So what happens when you melt the mantle, you remove all the rhenium, but in the residue you leave behind fairly high osmium concentrations. So if you bring in a metasomatic agent, if you bring in kimberlite, you bring something like that, you can enhance the rhenium concentrations, but you really don't affect the osmium very much because there's enough osmium left in the residue to just overwhelm this additional component. So if you look at the distribution of, of osmium isotopic data for on craton pyridotites, you see they have these very low negative numbers. Negative gamma osmium means low rhenium osmium ratio. Low rhenium osmium ratio is what we would expect for residues of partial melt extraction. So this is giving us this nice one stage of, of the mantle uh, story. Uh, and let's not worry about these. So, th so this gives you this idea of old melt extraction. You move over to neodymium, though. Uh, so samarium neodymium works the other way than rhenium and osmium. The daughter element neodymium is more incompatible than the parent samarium. So it's the opposite direction of the rhenium osmium system. Um, so if you have a residue, it should have a very high samarium neodymium ratio, and with time will evolve out to very positive epsilon neodymium. And there are some uh, xenolithic pyridotites that lie out here, uh, but you see the majority of them sort of plot here and then scatter down towards negative numbers. Uh, negative numbers are a sign of low samarium neodymium ratios. Uh, 
Low samarium and is a sign of light earth enrichment, just the opposite of what you would expect for a residue. So what this is showing you is that not only uh, have you had uh, the samarium and system with these rocks perturbed, it was perturbed long enough ago to evolve these kind of negative uh, epsilon and uh, values. Kimberlites, for example, modern kimberlites, mo most of things like, like the group one kimberlites will have a modern day epsilon and of about plus six. So you could, there is going to be isotopic exchange between the kimberlite and the, and, the, and the xenolith, but it's going to leave you at a value like this. These negative numbers must be a sign of a low samarium and ratio for a very long time. I mean, to get numbers like this, it has to be, be Archean. So this is a sign that at least some of this incompatible enrichment occurred a very long time ago. Uh, the other one, and potentially uh, one that uh, gives a clue as to how this occurred, uh, is shown by the diamond story. I, I showed this slide before, uh, uh, but I'm going to use it for a different uh, purpose this time. So what this shows, this is Steve Richardson's work. This is a Nedimium uh, evolution diagram. Again, 143 is derived from the decay of 147 samarium versus time. The green curve is what you'd expect for the mantle evolving along uh, uh, just without differentiation. And what Steve measured was uh, garnets that were included in diamonds, these beautiful little pictures he has of these things broken out. So very low nadimian isotopic compositions measured the very low samarium nadimian ratios, and you extrapolate them back in time until they intercept the mantle evolution curve at three and a half billion years. So that, I pointed that out as an, you know, in my first talk as an example of, of why we think the cratonic lithosphere is old. Uh, in this case, the important point about it is these values are negative. If we're looking at garnets that were parts of the residue of partial melt extraction, they would have very high samarium nadimian ratios. They would be off this chart to the positive side, so the very high 143, 144. So these garnets are not the restitic garnets. These are not the residues of partial melt extraction. These are produced by a metasomatic event occurring in the Archean. Uh, the diamond, carbon, is a very highly incompatible element. There should be no carbon left in the residue of the mantle. There are these diamonds. So basically, uh, I know the easy interpretation is both the garnet and the diamond that's surrounding it represents the precipitates of metasomatism, and it was metasomatism that was occurring in the Archean. We can get that uh, from a more general diamond study. So here's... Uh, looking at both uh, diamonds that are included in pritatite xenoliths. Most of the pritatite xenoliths have the low rhenium osmium plot down here. That's why they're useful as, as, as restites. High rhenium osmium ratio in these high 187s is a sign of, of uh, incompatible and enrichment with time. Uh, it's a crustal rocks, if you will. So you can get these sulfides. These are, these are ones out of diamond that Steve Shirey extracted. But uh, Bill Griffin and crew in, in Macquarie have done a bunch of sulfide analyses in pritatites. Those are the open squares here. And then what I've added to this diagram are the triangles, which represent eclogite uh, xenoliths that are, are come out of uh, both uh, the Kotval and Siberian craton. And I don't mean to say that they're exactly 3GA, but the point being is they scatter along a line that's consistent with an ar early Archean uh, uh, metasomatism. So high rhenium osmium represents the uh, replacement of crustal materials into the mantle. Uh, how do you do this? How do you get eclogites down? How do you get these sulfides down? Uh, Bob, I would argue that this is good evidence for, for subduction in the Archean. Uh, you, you may not agree, but uh, you're certainly recycling crustal materials uh, to the base of the lithosphere. Base of the lithosphere because these are diamonds, uh, so they have to be a uh, 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 fairly uh, deep uh, component. All right. Questions? All righty. Let's move on to a bigger picture of that, that same story. So here's the Wyoming craton uh, outlined in yellow here. We have xenoliths that unfortunately are not particularly well uh, placed across the craton. We've got a bunch of them that are off in this Proterozoic mobile belt up here. And then we have two. Williams is right on the edge. Homestead is, is inside. This would be actually a great locality. It's chock full of xenoliths, but it's owned by a diamond company who swears that there's diamonds in there and their stock price depends on there being diamonds in there so they don't let anybody in to prove whether there's diamonds there. <laughs> So, uh, so samples are not particularly abundant there just for that reason. Uh, and then the interesting part about this area is that uh, there's another kimberlite down here. This is a 380 million year old kimberlite. These are both about 50 million years. So these two are coming out during the middle of the Laramide. So during the major tectonic event in the Western US, this guy is coming out long before it. So this is probably when kind of, or the Western US was a nice stable uh, continental interior. If you look at the geotherm that's done from these Sloan xenoliths, here's two, the two groups. There, there's not a lot of xenoliths out of it, but uh, a low temperature group and a higher, higher temperature, deeper group. They defined a very cold geotherm. This geotherm is actually the geotherm that you calculate from modern day heat flow, which in this area is very high. 
So right now it's in the middle of the laramide. There's all sorts of heat flushing through the crust. But 380 million years ago, this had a geotherm that looked like a cratonic lithosphere. This is Proterozoic, though. It's off of the craton itself. And we'll look at, look at the ages of this in a second. But then you look at the uh, composition of the clinopyroxenes in these rocks, and you see these patterns. This is most incompatible at this end, least incompatible at this end. And they're maybe not as depleted as you would expect, but they, they show this sort of uh, more depletion in, in the more incompatible elements, suggesting that these, in fact, might be, be residues. They haven't had a strong metasomatic overprint. So that's 380 million years ago. Uh, this is 50 million years ago from the Williams. These define a, a pretty... Uh, typical cratonic geotherm, offset a little bit at uh, the, the deepest part to higher temperatures. So this, this is a 40 milliwatt uh, per square meter geotherm. So the mi middle uh, mantle stuff lies on that. But when you look at the clinopyrexine into those, you get these funny patterns that look like this. Uh, and these are typical patterns that you see in mantle lithosphere that was at one time depleted, but has had uh, light or er, incompatible and rich material added back to it. So you get these patterns where this part of it basically represents the addition of incompatible and compatible element rich liquids or equilibration with that. And then this side uh, represents the fact that these are so incompatible they just keep going through the mantle. So this is in, an indication of a multi-stage evolution. This is an indication perhaps of a single stage evolution. So then we look at the rhenium osmium data for these. Um, the, they're color coded here and symboled uh, by the different localities. Uh, the Sloan is uh, in a proterozoic lithosphere, so the oldest uh, ages we're getting are about 2 GA, and uh, there is, there's one down here, this, you know, this is nature for you, right? If, if this were over here, it would be a nice, clean story. Uh, but, you know, so you've got old material all the way down to the bottom of the Sloan. There's actually one that's off the diagram that's, that's down here at about 1.7. Uh, so the Sloan uh, section looks to be Proterozoic, which is the age of the overlying crust, down to of order 200 kilometers. When you look at the others, though, uh, Homestead, the, unfortunately, we're limited by the samples, but this gives a very old suite, mostly older uh, than 2.5 GA. There's some uh, funny stuff going on here at shallow depth, but it's mostly old. You look at the Williams, which, again, is right on the edge of the craton. You see this in the low-temperature prototype, so, again, uh, consistent with an old uh, Archean type of age. But then there's an offset to the high-temperature prototypes, and those go to these lower rhenium osmium uh, model ages. I wouldn't put too much uh, weight in what that means, other than it's a lot younger than, than uh, 2.5 GA. So this is the evidence that Gene was using, and I, unfortunately I provided this, uh, to suggest that the bottom of the Wyoming lithosphere is gone. That may be true, but I think what we may have to worry about is whether this is just sampling the marginal region of, of the northern part of the Wyoming craton. Because you look at, well, Homestead doesn't show any of this, but we don't have the sample, and Sloan doesn't show any of that at 380 million years. So this idea that metasomatism uh, may overprint the material and may cause uh, something funny going on at the bottom is where I'd like to end with the, the story of the uh, North China Craton. So the North China Craton, this is all Archean crust, this whole area here. Uh, there's some uh, mid-proterozoic 1.8 GA overprints here, but in fact there's, uh, we've done some work on lower crustal zenoliths from this area, and they're also Archean. So basically still, even today, the crust in this area is mostly, mostly Archean. The interesting part about this, though, is that you think the Western U.S. has had a hard life. Uh, Eastern China has some of the same geological phenomena going on, but it's got three convergence zones in the last 250 million years. One came in from the north, one came in from the south, and then there was the Pacific subduction off to the west. So over 250 million years, it's seen basically convergence and subduction against it from all directions. Uh, in all cases, it's been the hanging wall. So it's been above the subduction zones. It's been the recipient of the fluids that are contributed by the, these uh, subduction processes. So what's the evidence that the uh, um, North China Craton lost its root? Well, today, uh, certainly in the, western, in the eastern part, we have very high heat flow. We have lots of modern volcanism. It's seismically active. Uh, I showed you the tomography from, from Richard's work. It's very uh, slow mantle over the whole western half. It's got the extensive Mesozoic magnetism across it, ter tertiary basin development. Uh, the reason, so you know, none of this is consistent with it ever having a cratonic lithosphere. The reason we know that it did is that, like the case for the uh, Wyoming kimberlite, there are older kimberlites there, so Ordovician. Ben, what's Ordovician ages? 400 million, 300 million? Huh? About that? So I'm a geochronologist. I, the geologic time scale just is not lost to me. So <laughs> you know, why, don't, why don't we use numbers? Uh, anyway, so, uh, so it's, it's older than, than the activity. So uh, 
or the vision. So these are kimberlites. They bring up diamonds. They bring up uh, mantle zenoliths that record a typically cold cratonic geotherm. We have a few, like a handful of samples out of these things that give our kinrhenium osmium model ages. These are along the coast of China. Uh, so there was uh, our kin uh, mantle down there. But nowadays there's ter tertiary basalts. There's lots of basaltic volcanoes over the area. And it brings up uh, uh, what look like modern mantle. So I'll show you that at the last slide here. So here's the uh, locales of the Kimberlites. This is uh, actually a summary of early work that we, we did with Roberta and Shen Gao. Um, it's, it's been added on to in, in great detail by uh, Jingga Lu uh, in a couple of papers here. So if you want the detail, those are the one, definitely the ones to look at. So the, the North China Craytown, again, we have one locality here, uh, Hanaba uh, and Chisa. These are two um, um, late Cenozoic, so basically a uh, Holocene uh, eruptive centers that bring spinel peridotites to the surface. We have two kimberlites, Fujian and, and Menjin here, that are these Ordovician uh, kimberlites. They bring a, another xenolith suite to the surface. There's not a lot of them, unfortunately. So if you look at the xenoliths in uh, those two kimberlites, you see you get very low osmium isotopic compositions. These, at least in Fujian, these are consistent with rhenium depletion model ages of like two and a half GA or so. When you go over to Hanaba, you see you instantly get this shift over to more radiogenic osmium isotopic composition. But in Hanaba in particular, there's a correlation between rhenium osmium and osmium isotopic composition. So this is a real isochron diagram. And the correlation gets really good when you leave off a few of the points that don't fall on the line, um, which is, is sort of a typical thing here. You don't find many isochrons in mantle zenoliths, mostly because the rhenium osmium ratio is pretty easily perturbed by the kimberlite. But in this case, you, you do. You get a pretty nice isochron. It defines an age of about 1.9 GA. The main collisional of Event in this area is about that same age. So the answer is it looks like if there was Archean uh, lithosphere under here, it was replaced by, during this Proterozoic collision. And it's still there because this is sampled by this, this neogene basalt in Hanaba. But when you move out here to Chisha, which is along the coast, so here's the osmium isotopic compositions versus the rhenium osmium ratio. This is not an isochron. Uh, so you get a big scatter of points. Here's the primitive mantle. This gray band here is the range that you would see for modern abyssal peridotites. So if these peridotites are any different from what you would see in the ocean basin, you can't tell it on the basis of this data. So you're going from things that look like this uh, in the Ordovician. The, you know, this is the mantle under, under the western. So this is here. Fushan is here. So this is what it looked like in the Ordovician. Uh, you go to Chisha, it looks like modern mantle in the modern time. So this is the evidence that the North China Craton, in fact, lost its, uh, uh, lost its lithospheric root. As I said, I think it's kind of anomalous. I mean, this is the best documented example of it. The Wyoming Craton has often been used as an example of this, but I think the evidence for wholesale loss of Wyoming Craton is, is, is less obvious for, for the reasons I tried to show you. All righty. My God, I actually finished on time, <laughs> even early. So this is it. Uh, so the melt depletion of lithospheric prototypes uh, leaves them chemically buoyant. It makes them strong because you remove all the water. And it takes all the uranium and thorium out of them so they have no capacity of heat generation and they get cold. And I would argue that they get cold pretty fast. So this, I think, I mean, this is Tom Jordan's isopicnic model in a, in a nutshell. And I think the data that we've uh, produced over the last couple decades has, has pretty well borne that out. When you start looking at the more complicated aspects of, of it, though, uh, where you form the lithosphere, I think, is going to be a point of argument for quite some time. Uh, the data suggests that you had probably the best explanation is shallow melting, uh, probably under an ocean, ocean ridge uh, in a situation where the, uh, the potential temperature of the mantle is a few hundred degrees hotter than it is today. So basically just average uh, higher degrees of partial melting. I would argue that there's still a reasonable case uh, to look into water flux melting. Instead of just large degrees melting, you, you melt it over and over again, where you flux it with water in a convergent margin setting. And I think the arguments for this, uh, largely the silicon enrichment, which now is mostly restricted to the copal craton, we know, uh, but these other signatures like uh, the incompatible enrichment we find in diamonds, the fact that we find diamonds that are Archean period means that you're subducting crustal materials down to, to depths at the bottom of lithospheric keel in the Archean. So with these properties, uh, if you leave it undisturbed, uh, and I would say that most of the cratons seem to have been left undisturbed, you end up with these highly depleted lithospheric roots that survive for as long as the crustal section above them, so up to 3 billion years. Uh, I think that the best way to get rid of them is to have them affected by melt metasomatism. So you bring melts in from underneath. If you think about the reasons that went into this, 
that created the, the characteristics that we defined as, as isopycnic lithosphere, melt metasomatism is the exact reverse of that. So you're adding material to that lithospheric mantle that is removing all of these characteristics, the buoyancy, the uh, lack of heat generation, uh, the, the strength issues. And my, my uh, suggestion is, that it is in fact, melt metasomatism may be an intrinsic part of craton formation, but it's also the, probably the mechanism that leads to their destruction in the end. Uh, so thanks very much. Bob. So what you described are two really very interesting examples of decraftization. And and basically you can recognize isotopically these were regions of, of craton, but they're no longer behaving like cratons. And in the case of the Wyoming decratinization event, I agree it looks like melt infiltration related to subduction. But in the case of the North China craton, doesn't it look more like delamination because you've replaced these low um, rhenium osmium ages material with zero age? Yeah, material. I think the answer is, I mean, you lost the lithosphere that was there. So I, I, I think the North China case, as you say, is an excellent example where you, you, didn't, just, you didn't just remake it by adding new melt to it. You lost it. And, but I would argue that the reason that you lost it is probably because you changed its characteristics by this whole episode of, of, of fluid and melt ingestion. So you, you heated it up, you made it you know, rich in water, you softened it, you made it just waiting to fall off. Right? So I, I think in the end, Adrian's not around now, I think in the end it's mechanical delamination that, that drives it. But I would argue that it's the melt metasomatism that sets up the physical conditions that allows that to happen more effectively. Wyoming doesn't, but you have to remember that the Zenlith record is 50 million years ago. And a lot's, ha I mean, that was the peak of activity in, in Wyoming. So a lot was happening then, but a lot has happened since. Uh, the tomography diag diagram that I showed you is, of course, today. So this blueite that's, that's under Wyoming is, uh, is there now. Uh, Gene suggested it's the, the conjugate of the Shatsky rise that was stuffed under there. Uh, I would argue that the evidence is, is perfectly compatible with it being normal Archean lithosphere that's been there since the Archean. So with the, the modern tomography, I don't see a strong argument that the Wyoming craton is gone. And it may have been affected around the margins, but uh, it, I think it's still there. Done. Okay. I was, okay, I just had more of a general question about the source of the melts that you're metasomatizing the base of the cratons with. So at really, you know, if you have really thick cratons, it'd be hard to decompress the mantle significantly under these cratons. So how do you, yeah. what, do, what do you think the melts are coming from? No, that's a very good point. Um, I actually have a, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> uh, this diagram. I didn't show this because I was figuring I would have run out of time and it's incredibly complicated. These are kind of diagrams that your chemists show when they don't really have a clue. So, so, so you had enough lines so it looks like you've done, you've done your modeling but you don't know what the answer is. So this is various elements versus uh, osmium isotopic composition. These are for copal xenoliths and it's exactly the question you're asking. So if you start from a, a highly depleted residue here, what do you have to add to, to get, and look at silica here. This is the silica enrichment that was what we we're trying to model. What kind of melts do you have to add to move off in those directions? Uh, so here's our carbonatite. That's something that you might get at those kind of depths. It doesn't work. Uh, kimberlites, uh, another kind of melt you get at those kind of depths. They don't work. Uh, this is a TTG, which um, you wouldn't normally expect at those depths, but that's a melt that you might be able to get off of subducted slab but it doesn't matter because that doesn't work either. Okay? So what you get actually, if you look at this, the best fits are with some kind of a basaltic rock, a diorite in this case. I don't know why we call it diorite. It's the trouble, Nina's a European, so it's, it's not a basalt. Um, so, or just plain orthopyroxene addition. Um, so the trouble with doing these types of melt additions, if you think about the way that melts move in the mantle in this region, and Chip can probably comment better than I can, but I think it's unlikely that you just take a residue and you add 5% basalt to it and that's what you end up with. 
these melts are probably fluxing through the mantle. They're reacting with it. One of the reaction products is, is in a, from a silica-rich melt going through a pyritite is orthopyroxene, and then the melt keeps moving. So basically, the imprint of that melt is the orthopyroxene, even though the melt itself wasn't necessarily orthopyroxene-rich. So, so that would be a slab melt? I, th I think a slab melt is prob probably a good, uh, so the good model. So measured, like, oxygenized types of minerals to... Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure there's been enough work on uh, the minerals in the peridotites. There has been a lot of auction isob work on the eclogite zealous in the Kotval, and not all, but many of which show uh, variable oxygen, so consistent with them being surficial basalts that, that were, were put down. Uh, but it's a good, I, I don't know if there's been enough oxygen data done on peridotites to answer that question. Good, good question. Chip, I don't know if you have more to say about orthopyroxene enrichment, but... It's a mystery to me. No, I don't. But I, I was going to ask you about the, the North uh, China Craton. I mean, if, if, if you have the isopycnate, uh, what would be the throughout uh, to begin with? Then uh, the addition of water may change the rheology, but it's not clear what the driving force for the, the sinking and delamination. So how do we deal with that part of it? I, it, it we can get around that if we if we sort of treat it as as uh, on average, you know, overall it's isopycnic, but in fact that there are there actually are density variations within it such that the upper part is perhaps denser, so that when you do add the water, um, you have a driving force yeah. for delamination. No, I think something like that makes sense. I I mean the actual process of delamination sort of escapes me. In a it's, metasomatism in a way is anti-delamination because you're the metasomatism is going to raise the temperature of it, which makes it more buoyant. So, so you have to ask whether the, the buoyancy from increased temperature overwhelms the lack of buoyancy by adding garnet back to it, right, from, from the melt. So those, those are competing factors. Uh, I have to think that mechanical issues you know, come into this in a big way, and if Adrian were here, comment on it more than I, I could. So I, I, I think unquestionably you have to have mechanical intervention here for something like China. I think the fact that it's sitting right on, a, right on the continental edge in an area that's probably a back arc basin, uh, my guess is that the, the surrounding mantle flow had a lot to do with it, but you probably sort of uh, uh, created the conditions in that lithosphere that if you pushed on it, it would fall off. Right, so, yeah. so some portions of it have to be negatively buoyant. Yeah. They're just stiff. Yeah, and, and it, it was his sort of background motions that finally caused it to just, just fall off. Uh, just a word of caution about isopicnic. Uh, isopicnic doesn't make the thing stable. Even if you've got a zero uh, variation of density because you, you're offsetting completely the temperature effect by the compensation effect, this might still go unstable. And in fact, you might even go unstable with a density profile which is all globally uh, uh, stable. You know? So uh, isopicnic doesn't make it stable. You can solve for the problem, and because temperature and composition have completely different diffusivity, this is what drives the instability of the system. So do not equate isopicnic with a stability. Yeah. But I think that you also showed that when this stuff begins to sink and it warms up, then it becomes buoyant. So it does, you know, if it's isopicnic before it sinks, and then it warms up, it becomes buoyant again. So, so it has an, a, you know, intrinsic wish to stay near the surface. Okay, would it be crazy to think in terms? You've talked about metasomatism, and I'm thinking as seismologists about the mid lithospheric discontinuity, which we see from receiver functions, from anisotropy, and other, and. Uh, um, Norm Sleep wrote this paper about uh, metasomatic, uh, like a boundary, and other, other papers also. Could you have like a process where the metasomatism uh, stops at some depth in the mid-lithosphere and, and weakens yeah. you know, the bottom? And well, you saw, you saw Raj's talk. So, so if you look at the melting curve of carbonatites, it has all these, these funny cusps in it. So each one of those represents a place where you could be crystallizing out carbonatitic uh, compositions. So it's easy to say that you could get these metasomatic horizons in the lithosphere. Uh, I think the work hasn't been done to see whether those horizons and the MLD match. Uh, 
if you look at uh, a, you know well-studied craton like the Kopval in particular, I mean the Reichert and Shear model has uh, uh, what they call it the LAB, but it's at like 120 kilometers. And if you look at the zonth record, there is nothing at 120 kilometers. So I have no idea what that is. So I would turn it back on the seismologist. It would be good to see where there's well-defined MLDs in an area where we know what the zonth record is and see if you can actually match them up with something that's observable. So um, I, I, you know, I don't know what they are. So. From the anisotropy point of view in North America, the answer is yes. Yeah. And we do. Yeah, but that's in the slave too, where we also know that well, we have. It's, a, it's it's over the whole kraton. Okay, all well, of the, all yeah, of we don't have a great depth. record in the, in the superior in terms of sampling, but in the slave, we know that it's layered, uh, you know, fr from the Zenlith record. So, so that's a perfect example where you, you probably would expect all sorts of layers and uh, and anisotropy because of the different histories of assembly of it. Kopval, uh, you know, I don't I don't see the evidence for that. So it'd be fun to look at different kratons with this idea that they don't all have to be the same. Don, 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 did you have a question? question? Yeah, I've got several, actually. Uh, I think the original uh, inventor of delamination was an Arthur Holmes who argued that in orogenic zones you tend to over-thicken the crust and you lose it in what we would call back arc basins. Right. I think you're confirming that general idea, aren't you, that uh, slab fluids, therefore, things that delaminate are almost by definition above slabs. Yeah, well, I mean, you're getting to the uh, Roberta's talk and uh, maybe the talk that Bob will get into tomorrow is uh, you know, Peter, if you've seen Peter Kellerman's latest models for reworking continental crust and turning it from a basalt into an andesite, uh, his model does it during the act of subduction. So basically, while you're making a convergent margin, you're melting the mantle, bringing basalt up, that basalt is differentiating in the crust the dense residues of that differentiation are at the bottom. The siliceous stuff, the andesitic stuff is in the crust at the top. The lower crust is made out of peroxinites or, or what, what have you. And that stuff actually gets taken down with the subduction zone. So it's, it's buoyantly unstable sitting at the base of the arc crust. And you've got all this motion going on anyway. So it's basically eroded at the same time you're making the crust. I, I mean, if you ask me how, how you do this processing in the continental crust, that strikes me as the most uh, right, but you just obvious don't, option. You just don't delaminate willy-nilly in the middle of a continent. No, I don't think you do. Subduction. Yeah, no, I don't think you do. I, I, I think you have to do it in a place where you're, you've got active motion around it. You've got slab fluids coming in. And convergent margins are a great place to, to mess around with, with continental lithosphere. I think the Sierra Nevada, this whole issue about whether it's delamination of southern Sierra Nevada, I think subduction zones set up the conditions that allow mantle dynamics to cause delamination. And another question is, if you raise the temperature of a typical craton uh, by, say, 200 degrees, would you have any melt in that craton, what you call lithosphere? Not if it's not metasomatized. And, uh, so 150 degrees, you're at 1,000 degrees centigrade, raise it by 200. <coughs> Melting? No. Do you have any craton where you don't have metasomatism in it somewhere? I think you mentioned, sir. Actually, actually, I don't think metasomatism is as abundant in, in cratons as, as people think. I mean, Roberta uh, Rodnick actually did the best example of this. This gets to the issue I tried to show with the barium. And, you know, if you estimate the barium concentration of lithospheric mantle from looking at peridotites, you get a very high number. You can do the same thing with potassium. But the advantage with potassium is it's also a radioactive element. So if you take Zenlis and you calculate their average potassium concentration and you assume that the whole lithospheric mantle has that potassium concentration, then you get heat fluxes out of the mantle that are much too high. So the answer is, is that the degree of metasomatism we see in the Zenlis has to be higher than the average degree of metasomatism that's in the lithospheric mantle. So I, I, don't, I don't think the whole section of lithosphere, and that gets to Barbara's question, I don't think we have seriously metasomatized uh, lithospheres, except in these cases like like maybe Wyoming now and, and China in particular, where it's just sitting there under, a, you're sitting above a slab just being sopped up by, you know, slab fluids. But those analysts would be melted if you raise the temperature by 100 degrees. The metasomatized analysts. Yeah, but you have group two. You know, I, there's group one and group two Kimberlites for, for those of you who know and care about Kimberlites. Uh, group twos are very different. They're, pota they're very potassic. They have very stre extreme isotopic compositions. Those might well be lithospheric melts of a metasomatized base of lithosphere, uh, but they're rare. I mean, they're almost only in South Africa. Uh, the regular Group One kimberlite, like like Raj suggests, is, looks simply like a 
very, very low degree melt of normal mantle. Any more questions? Hi, Rick. Um, getting back to this question about the North China uh, Crichton, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, if you add water to, uh, uh, you know, to the cratonic lithosphere, you, uh, as you were saying, um, you know, you can possibly will reduce the viscosity, um, but the, you know, the effect on the reality, on the, on the buoyancy is, is not uh, clear. Uh, I guess there are probably buoyancy available to, to kind of, uh, to, to remove the, uh, uh, the cratonic lithosphere that is the slab buoyancy. Uh, but I guess I'm kind of struggled a little bit that is, uh, with that concept as well. That is, uh, if you look at uh, the North China uh, Kraton, uh, you're, I guess as you showed in the diagram that, you know, you look at uh, the subduction in the north and the south, they actually end kind of uh, before 200, around 250, right, MA. Right. Um, whereas, uh, I guess the volcanism that I kind of, uh, in, you know, that indicated the beginning of the denomination didn't get a start until like uh, Ju uh, Jurassic, is that? Yeah, I think yeah. It's so in the that's quite a hundreds, yeah. that yeah. kind of uh, feels like uh, by then the um, slab buoyancy, assuming slab buoyancy, kind of helped, uh, and then by then the slab buoyancy pretty much is gone, right? Um, so then you, you talk about the subduction from the Western Pacific side, and that subduction has been there for almost forever, right? So then you know, so, so when when what you know, so I guess it's kind of hard to relate to the subduction with the Western uh, Pacific as well. Yeah. So I guess it's really, I mean, even, even if we accept somehow subduction, you know, water all kind of play some role, but I think the picture is still very, very murky. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. you know, why, why it did, what it did, when it did is, is still a very good question. But, but it, I, I find your question interesting in the sense that uh, it wasn't very many years ago before Adrian did some of his work where you know, uh, genodynamics could never preserve a craton period. So, I mean, there, 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 there are many papers that, that say that cratonic lithosphere is unsurvivable, right? Well, so, I, I guess, you know, you, if you want, uh, uh, if you look at the geodynamic models, I, I think we can make anything happen, we can make anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true, right? You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's a model parameter. So if you think, if you, use, if you make uh, the cratons to be extremely viscous, then they can stay there for the, yeah. forever. Uh, if you reduce viscosity by saying, okay, we'll bring water uh, or, 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 you know, plastic rheology and with uh, unrealistically unreal small yield stress, then, you know, then nothing will be stable. Yeah. I mean, so uh, that's just the way it is. But I think the key is to yeah. figuring out which are the conditions that, that led, led to this. I think an inter this is an interesting contrast with the Sierra example. As, as I understand the Sierra example, the, I think the conventional wisdom is that uh, delamination was driven by lower crustal delamination. Whereas if you look in, in China, uh, we actually have lower crustal zenith. So this is, I tried to fit it to this, but this, the scales are a bit different. But that, that line is this line in the middle here. So in the central block, we actually have uh, zenith from a few of these areas that are of lower crust, and that lower crust is Archean. And it's quite happy Archean. Whereas when you go into the mantle, it's Proterozoic. So this is a good example where um, you have your Archean crust left over and you just peeled off the Archean lithosphere from it. Whereas I think the explanation of the Sierra is that it was, in fact, lower crustal delamination that started the whole, the whole process. So I think there's more than one way to do this. Uh, I think, I hope that I, I left you with the impression that I think lithosphere delamination is actually a pretty unusual event. Given how much time we're spending talking about it, I think the examples of it are actually pretty limited. So North China is a good one. I'm not convinced Wyoming is one at all. I think the Sierra case is reasonable. So, so you know, I, I just don't think that it's as abundant as, as the amount of uh, words and uh, text is, that put how to it suggests. Because hmm? we have zenoliths of it. Yeah, but how do you know you lose a lot of crust? Well, it could have been thicker, but, it, but it's a normal thickness now. So you could have had a much thicker crust than that. Well, it could have been thicker, but it's a normal thickness now. So you could have had a much thicker crust that, that fell off. Well, if the crust but, is much thicker than normal, it's equity. Yeah, but I mean, it's Archean crust. And, you know, what we know is that you're not going to keep 70 kilometer thick crust around since the Archean, right? Because so, yeah, but, so there, 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 but there's no expectation that there was anomalously thick crust there bef in the uh, Mesozoic. Maybe, but there's no reason to, su to suggest it. Okay. <laughs>